since they're walking around, just hand them your check if you would like to do that, and we will make sure that it gets um, where it needs to go. I think this is last, no, this is not last but not least, but this is important. So right now we have 55 kid kits. Our goal is 250, and it's through the month of June, so we are getting down to the wire. So if you've forgotten or you just are sitting at home, go ahead, let's bring your kid kits in so we can reach our goal and touch the heart of a child who needs food and to know that they are loved. Make sure you place those things in a plastic grocery bag and you can just leave it in the front of the church. There's a box out there. We are also collecting regular food, um, continuing our food drive. And I want to give a huge shout out to Bruce Goral. I think he's here somewhere today. Y'all take a He is the resident truck taker. He, he takes truckloads of food down to Common Heart for us. And, I talked to Keith the other day, and he said, man, Bruce is like part of us. Um, yeah, that's Sandy Bruce, too, and going, yes, he is. So a huge uh, shout-out to him. And last but not least, a huge shout-out to Mike and Wendy Williams. I think she was up here mailing, too, um, for our stage. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, he said, we need it. And he said, you know what, I, I, I got this. And so we, we shout out so we can see everybody um, in the back and all of that. So it's great. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, we thank you so much for this amazing and beautiful day. I thank you to look out and see all the cars who are here to come and worship you and for all the people online who are tuning in this morning and going, this is kind of different, but it's okay, because you are still at the center of it all. We continue this morning as a church to pray for our community. We continue to pray for those people who are being called to protest. I ask protection on them. We continue to lift up all of our health care workers, but most importantly, Lord, we pray this morning that during this season of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit would come and speak to us and speak to our hearts in such a powerful way that we are not only changed, we are transformed, that we not only think of great things to do, we actually do them, that we not only witness for you in our mind and in our actions, but we witness to you with our words and all that we say and do. And as a body of believers, we come together praying the prayer you have taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father,
Thank you, Van, so much. That was awesome. I'm not going to lie, it's hot up here, so um, my sweat's going in my eyes, but that's okay. I guess the Holy Spirit will tell me what to say, even if I have to, if, if, even if it ain't look, right? Um, so I want to start out this morning by saying, I don't know if you've seen this commercial or not, but there is this commercial. We don't have cable. We do different things, and there's this commercial that comes on over and over and over and over and over again. Anybody seen it? If you've seen it, how? If you love it, it's called Flowers. You can go online and look at it. It is this awesome, awesome commercial. It catches me every single time. The speaker in the commercial says this. After 225 years of Jim Bean, you think we just look back on our past and say, and then it kind of stops. And the music is playing and it's showing them being in the, um, um, down in the, the, where the barrels are, where they, they have their liquor. And he says, nope, we are looking to our future. And the commercial goes on with these great graphics of busting through those old barrels into a fancy new lab. And it said, he, the speaker says, new ways and new ideas, new flavors, new mixers. And he ends the commercial, this is the part that I love, he ends the commercial this way. He says, we're not raising a glass to the last 225 years. We're raising a glass what? To the next. To the 225 years to come. That is what we need to focus on today as a church. core of the local church, we've looked at mission, what our mission is to make disciples, our values, like looked at the most important value in my opinion there's lots of values but the most important is the relationships with people and today we look at how do we look toward the future how do we have vision it is at the core of what the church was designed to be and i think maybe this is the one area that we fail the most as a church capital c church if you look in scripture, if you look in the Greek, there's lots of different words for vision in the Greek. But if you go and you look at several different ones, there, the word vision in its Greek form is used. Are you ready? Hundreds of times in scripture. Not 10, not 30, not 40. Hundreds and hundreds of times in scripture. This talk of dreaming prophesying, speaking, vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. In other words, if you do not have a vision or you do not have dreams, everything's just going to fall apart. There's no order, there's no direction, it just falls apart. And I think Jesus knew this. I think God knew it at the founding of the of creation. Jesus certainly knew this. There has to be some sort of vision in who we are and what we are about and looking to the future and not worrying about the past, but honoring it and moving forward. Brandon J. O'Brien, in his article, Can You Imagine? Why Imagination is crucial, crucial to the Christian Life, writes this. If reason changes our minds, imagination changes our hearts. And touching the imagination can inspire us with a vision of God's reality that will compel us to act will compel us to act. Our vision infuses our imagination with possibilities. And the church has a vision for the possibilities to come. Vision fuels those possibilities. And a value system points us to Jesus. This, that the Lord replied to the people of Israel, basically, and said, write and make it plain on tablets so that a runner may run with it. A church, if a people, if we don't have a vision, a dream, a place to go to, 
then we have very, very little, and we will burn out very, very quickly. We need to be looking toward what God is doing in the future, not just what God has done in the past. The Israelites, they went through a lot of hard times. They show us in Scripture what falling apart looks like. Anybody ever feel like you're falling apart? See, right? I mean, there are times you feel like you're just falling apart. We see the Israelites give us an example of what that is. Thanks. And COVID-19 and losing heart. And they experienced what it was like to turn from God. And they also experienced what it was like to turn back to God. And we can see in those scriptures that every time people followed God and followed God into the future, even when they did not know where that future was going to take them, things went well. Happiness was there. Contentment. Fight. Determination. Perseverance. It was all there. Habakkuk. He's trying to give the Israelites a vision when he writes this this, this book, this, these, these words. He's trying to give the Israelites a vision that would inspire them to grow. I want you to listen to this. It would inspire them to grow from a faith of perplexity and doubt to the height of absolute trust in God. And he had doubt himself. But even in the midst of his own doubt and his own questions about God and how God was working in the world, he continued to move forward into the future. I want you to go back. I want you to think about this. A faith of perplexity and doubt. Y'all, we are a society that is filled and riddled and told that perplexity and doubt are normal things to have faith in. And God is saying, no, have faith in me. We wring our hands constantly. We worry, we struggle, we try and figure it all out. Our faith is on perplexity and doubt. We question. And we question. And we question, and we do all of make all of these decisions based on what is going to make me okay. And typically, nothing makes me okay until we transform that faith that we put in perplexity and doubt, and put our trust in God, our faith in God. <laughs> Now, I know a lot, y'all know, a lot of us are sitting here today, we're going, well, vision's so easy. You just dream a little bit. Just think about the future. And you know what? I think it's one of the hardest things for a church to do, to get down to it, to really embody and to live out what it is that we have given credit to God for calling us to be and to do. It's hard to stand for it. It's easy to talk about it, but it's hard to live it out, to make decisions based on those goals that we say, based on that vision that we reach, the uncomfortable goals, the impossible goals. And I believe with all of my being, and I've seen it and I've lived it, and before I was in ministry, I saw it and I fought against it because I was new and didn't know better. We set ourselves up as churches to fail over and over and over. We want success to be measured only by this much. Can y'all see that? We don't have success. We don't plan for success this big. Our churches are failing, and St. Francis, I'm calling us to not fail anymore. Thank you. I'm calling us to have the impossible vision to reclaim through the power of the Holy Spirit what it is that we are called to be and what we are called to do. Be 
fear keeps us from going there. Is there anyone here today that is fearless? No. But who is filled with fear? Right? Anybody ever been fearful? You can toot. I wanted you to I wanted you to toot for me, but I wanted you to toot for each other too. Because we are a fearful people. And fear is the antithesis of vision. It's the opposite. Fear keeps us looking in the past. Fear tells us it's too much work. It won't work. And the ever popular, we've never done it that way before. Fear tells us if we try something new and fail, it'll be too embarrassing. Or if we step out on this stage and stand in front of people and their cars and preach how embarrassing that's going to be and it just won't work. Right? Y'all with me? Fear says keep the status quo. Keep everything level. Everybody content. Because if we're there, that must be of God. Fear tells us to control all things. Fear says, if you're going to do something, you better make sure it's going to work. That you're going to accomplish. You need this assurance that it's all going to be right and okay. The church has become afraid to make mistakes. And church, I gotta tell you, when we are afraid of making mistakes, guess who watches us? Guess who hears that? Our kids hear that. And then they become afraid of making mistakes. Our society doesn't want us to make mistakes. People get fired over making a mistake. So it's no wonder we're fearful. Then here in our church, make mistakes. We can seek God and we can go for it. And I think that going for it is in every single one of us that we hold back because we're afraid of what someone might say. Kelly and Paul Marks, everybody knows Kelly and Paul. They travel around the country and if they don't travel around the country, that's my dream for them because the stuff that they teach is really, really awesome. They teach this left brain, right brain exercises to help us tap into our creativity. Because fear, and all you left brain people are gonna like shake your head no, but fear to only use the left side of our brain, the logic. Taking a chance helps us to use our, the right side of our brain, the creativity piece. The trust, the dreams, it's where vision comes from. It's where vision comes alive. Kelly told me the other day when I was talking to her that um, NASA did a test, and I don't know when. I know half of you smart people know when. But that NASA did a test of a group of five-year-olds. And they gave them a test. And at the end of the test, 95% of those five-year-olds that were tested were considered to be creative geniuses. Five-year-olds, 95%, they were creative geniuses. When those, when that same test was given to a group of adults, less than 5% of adults tested were tested to be creative geniuses. Do you see where we have gone? Do you see where fear has taken us? Do you see where it can only be a certain way, the path, the road that we have taken? Dreaming, exploring, I think that's where personal connection with Jesus comes in, is in this dreaming and exploring and being able to trust God. I look around this church and I think about Ignite the Vision. We went out there, didn't we? And even in the midst of going out there, there was still so much fear, but we did it anyway. I think about our breakfast with Santa. I remember the first year that we did an outreach event for this community. My hands were ringing, and everybody else's hands were ringing. 
And they said, well, we might have 20 people. What if we only have 20 people? I was saying the same thing. What if nobody comes? And we finally said, you know what? We are doing this to be a community church for people to have a safe place to come. And hundreds of people came. Oh, God. Right? The same. The same with Easter extravaganza. It's like we are a place that we need to invite people to come and say, no matter where you've been, and no matter what you've done, and no matter what you believe, and no matter what you, how bad you think you screwed up, here is a place for you to come and be loved and accepted and told about Jesus and experience the power of the Spirit. But that is a vision that is worth keeping, right? Let me bring you back to Jim B. Mark's laughing at the Jim Bean example. I think it's a perfect example. If liquor can do it, surely God can do it at a church, right? <laughs> Their vision is growing for good. Everything they do and everything they think and everything they plan is so that they will grow for good. It goes on to say that their mission is to inspire human connection. That's kind of cool, isn't it? They want to inspire for human connection. And I love that they said, we're going to raise a glass. You know what it means when you raise a glass? What's it mean, Jenny, when you raise a glass? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it means you are honoring. It means you are with them. It means that you are part of it. And so I ask us, St. Francis, what are we raising a glass to? We are raising a glass to be part of the dream that Jesus has for us. We are raising a glass to say, you know what, God? I am scared to death, but wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. You know what, God? There's this thing that's been weighing on my heart for, for months and months, and I'm too scared to do anything about it. But today, I'm going to raise a glass to you, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to start. Because it's our dream, and it's our vision. I love the vision that I feel like that we have here. Or maybe this is my own personal vision. I kind of just said it. But I envision a church that welcomes red and yellow, black and white. A church that makes room for the people in our world who continuously, continuously have a door shut in their face. Can you imagine what that's like? Always the door shut in your face. And what it would do for somebody if you said, come here. We will not only welcome you, but we will open the door for you. And we will walk with you and we will help you. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. So challenge us today to think about what it is that God would have you to be and to do. And I want you to email those to me. I want every single one of you, Facebook, drive-in, I want you to think about it. I want you to take the time to email to me what your vision for life is with God. Because the back it says to write down that revelation. And oftentimes, writing it down will help us come to fruition. And it will help us overcome the fear. So I'm just going to share a couple things with you because they meant something to me. NASA's vision is that they will continue to push the frontier of space. We know what Jim Beam is. We just said that. Growing for good. Martin Luther King, he believed that all men are created equal and should enjoy the same rights and privileges. And you can see how his life and his mission lives into his vision. 
What are we going to be for the next 225 years, church? What is God calling us to be and to do? It's part of who we are. It's the core of who we are as followers of Christ. Amen and amen.
when all those start coming back, it's going to be all the same thing because God is speaking to us in a mighty way. May you leave here today filled with peace and the power of the Holy Spirit. I miss you guys so much. And I know we will be together soon. Go and be.